Hey guys, welcome to this new class. Today we're gonna start a new project. As you guys know, this is gonna be a full project, so get yourselves ready because it's gonna be quite a ride. And uh, here's the final result. After this two hours of class, you guys are gonna be able to create something like this. Make sure to go for the files. Uh, they are gonna be provided as well for you guys. And uh, follow along to learn all of the tips, tricks, and techniques that we can share with you uh, using Substance Painter and a little bit of Maya. So yeah, without anything else to add for now, guys, thank you very much for your support. Make sure to keep that support coming. That's what keeps us going. And uh, yeah, uh, enjoy. Hey guys, welcome to this special chapter where I'm going to be taking you through this journey and we're going to be texturing this very nice Majora's Mask model. We're going to be taking a look at some of the most uh, like interesting things that people ask about, such as UVs. We're going to take a look at how to properly create some maps to be helpful or to use them inside of uh, Substance Painter. And then we're going to take you, I'm going to guide you through all of the different steps that you're going to need to create an amazing uh, element. Remember that this file is available for you on the project files or um, on one of the links that we normally share with you guys. So this is going to be the basic construction of the um, of the Majora's Mask. And as you can see, the model is fairly good. I did. This a couple of uh, years ago for another class that I was uh, teaching and um, it's it's not bad I mean there's a couple of things that we can improve like there's a little bit of uh, overlap there we don't have that overlap when we smooth the object which is uh, important we're gonna talk about this uh, very very shortly and um, yeah so now now we're gonna talk about UVs UVs are one of those things that a lot of people get confused with because let's face it they're a little bit tricky people sometimes don't know where to start don't know what we're looking for they sometimes don't even know what they are so let's take a quick look at what UVs are for those of you that are just learning UVs are this they're a 2D representation of a 3D figure. That's like the theor theoretical of uh, like way to explain UVs, okay? So every single object that has a volume that's a 3D object, and I'm talking about every single thing that you can imagine, can be transferred down into a 2D map so that we can uh, see its whole surface stretched out in a, in a flat surface. Now, when you do this, certain objects, especially organic objects such as characters and creatures, they will have a little bit of distortion, uh, but that's completely normal and uh, other things like mechanical things might have something called seams so UVs again are these things where we take a character and we split it out into so many different parts so that we can start uh, working with it in the in the texture department okay now there's a couple of things that you need to take into account when building UVs and I'm actually going to be writing those down here in the notepad so that you guys can remember the first one is we of course want every single part of the object so every polygon should have UVs. You don't want to have any piece that's not going to have a UV. Sometimes we do keep objects without UVs, especially when we're doing like marketing marketing for super clean objects and you just work with materials. But more often than not, you're going to have every object have a polygons. Second, we are going to have something called seams. So you want to hide the seams on your object. Third, all of the UVs or all of the elements that you're going to have must have proportionate UVs. This is one of the most important parts and a lot of people mess this up. Proportionate UVs means that the density that each like polygon has along the or in the UV map should be proportionate to every other polygon. So no polygon should have more like density or more resolution than any other piece. UVs should also be ordered, okay? This is another important one. You want to make sure that the map that you're reading, at the end of the day, it's a map. You want to make sure that it makes sense. So right now, this mask already has UVs, as you can see right here. Um, and they're not bad. These are actually like quite useful and, and workable UVs, but I'm going to make sure I'm going to show you how to create even better UVs. Okay, so let's go. Uh, this technique that I'm going to show you is uh, one that I've been kind of like developing on, on my own for the last couple of years. And I think it's one of the easiest way to explain it. It's not the only one. And there's more advanced tricks here and there that you can learn about UVs. But this is going to be helpful or useful for you guys on 90% of the occasions. So I'm going to grab the object. And the first step is going to UV and delete the UVs. I don't want to have any UVs. I don't want to have any UV information. I just want to make sure that we're standing from a clean slate. Now I'm going to select this guy right here. And I'm going to go to UV and I'm going to select this option called camera based projection UV. OK, so just click camera base. And what's going to happen is we're going to take a snapshot of the character based on where our camera is. And right now our camera is kind of like three quarters right here. Let's do it again. So camera base. Whoop. Let's go object mode UV and we go camera base before we continue, though. Let me turn on car next so we have everything. There we go. And if we go into UB, a UB editor, you're going to see that we have that. It's just a screenshot of where our character or our little uh, object is right now. 
Now, the reason why this is important, it, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit stupid, but I'm, I'm just gonna like mention it here because I think it's really useful. It's a bug that Maya has. When you have like, let's imagine a cube, if you do this technique where you take the picture from like a perspective view like this, oh, that's a horrible perspective. There we go. Every single face of the of the cube, you can imagine all the faces on the back are gonna have some sort of like representation on the 2D view, right? If you have your cube and you're seeing it from the front view, like perfectly on the front view, and you take a picture, the sides right here, the, the faces on the sides and on the top won't have any any surface on the on the 2D view. And sometimes that freaks out the unfold uh, tool that we're gonna be using later on. And since they don't have any any surface area, they are not taking into account for the unfold operation and therefore we don't get proper UVs. So the way that I found that this, well, like we can get rid of that specific uh, problem or bug is to make sure that when you take the screenshot, you do it in this sort of like three quarter view way so that you can ensure that pretty much every single face is gonna have at least a little bit of a surface area, okay? Now that we have this, we're gonna go into one of my favorite tools. And for that, I'm actually gonna open the UV editor again, just to have this thing open, because there's a nice little tool that we can use while the UV editor is open. If you have two screens, just move this to the other screen. We don't need it right now. We just need it to be open, because we're gonna go into UV, and we're gonna say 3D cut and sew UV tool. This is the tool that we're gonna be using the most, and we're gonna be using this tool to, as the name implies, cut the UVs into different sections, and make sure that these things are gonna unfold nicely. Now, if you take a look at the UV, you're gonna see that we already have some cuts. For instance, the eyes, they're just half spheres and, and they're cut right there in the middle. So we don't need to cut the spheres because they already have like a proper unfold section. The spikes, as you can see, they also have a proper unfold section here on the bottom, but we do need to cut the spikes on the sides. So I'm gonna do a quick drawing here with some of the like the basic shapes that you're gonna find uh, when UVing so that you can reference this. If you have a cylinder, okay? If an object that you're trying to unfold or to cut is a cylinder, you usually wanna, wanna cut the cap. Well, let's redraw that. So the cap, the other cap, and one line across. That's usually the way you're gonna do cylinders. Why? Because once this unfolds, you're gonna have one circle, one stripe, and another circle over here, okay? So you're gonna have the cap, the other cap, and then this stripe right here. If you're doing a cube or any sort of like rectangular looking shape, kind of like a screen or like a phone, usually, usually you wanna cut uh, either halfway through the object, that's an option to have both uh, sides, or you're gonna cut the cap on the back and then a little bit of the corners here to help this thing unfold a little bit better. And the resulting piece would be like a flat surface here and there another little uh, uh, shape with like a couple of wings like this. That's usually the way to go. Again, if you if there's like a nice little like insertion line right here, like a modeling thing, it's very easy to just cut right there and then cut those little flaps and that's gonna give you an even better effect. For spheres, if you're doing spheres, one of the things that you wanna do is very similar to the uh, cylinders. You're gonna cut the cap on the top of the cylinder, or the sphere, sorry, another cap, and then one line across. And what it's usually gonna have is just gonna have one pole, the other pole, and then you're gonna have something like this. Sometimes, um, what's the word? A Maya kind of like breaks this apart and creates like a really weird shape. That's fine, it's to avoid a little bit of distortion, but that's usually the shape that you're gonna have for a sphere. If you don't UV a sphere from scratch, you're gonna have this sort of like square with spiky things on the top. Sometimes that works, just be careful that whatever model you're using doesn't get a lot of like distortion at the top because uh, the poles can get cut into like really weird shapes. This one that I'm showing here usually works a little bit better. And uh, and that's it. Pretty much every other shape that you find on your modeling journey is gonna be a variation of this. It's either gonna be a, a cylindrical shape, a square shape, or a, a spherical shape. So in the case of the spikes that we have right here, as you can see, they resemble or they're really close to, um, what's the word, to cylinders. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do cap, cap, and across. Now, we don't have a cap on, a cap on the top, so we only need to cut across, and that's it. So I'm gonna go... I'm gonna go right here and just cut this one. Now, which line or how do I know which line to cut? Usually you wanna cut the one that's gonna be the less visible. So for instance, on this ones on the top, the back ones are probably are probably gonna be the best ones. But then on this ones on the sides, this side views, I would say they're a really good uh, place. And usually the ones on the, on the lower side right here, because those are the places that you're rarely gonna see. So we're gonna go for this ones, this ones, this ones. 
and this ones. You might be wondering, well, why, why wouldn't they cut, we cut like here on the side? Because we might have like this sort of like three quarter view uh, for, the, for the mask. And, and that means that we do need to keep the, the little like UV section right there. So that's it. So now the spikes are done, the eyes are done, and um, and that we can jump onto some more complex shapes. So I'm gonna double click this phase right here, which is this huge, huge island on the element. And um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna isolate this piece right here, like this. So this option right here, it's isolate select, allows us to uh, jump onto whatever we have selected, even if it's a selection within a selection, like in this case, the faces. And I'm gonna grab this piece right here. And again, I'm just gonna say UV, 3D cut and so UV tools like this. Uh, now what I, I want to do is I want to I want to decide or I need to decide where I want the cut to be. And again, following some of the rules, we want to make sure this is as hidden as possible. But at the same time, we want to have the least amount of distortion. So there's two options for us. We can use this actual right here, this one that goes on the on the back side, or we can use this one right here. Now, what would be like the advantages and disadvantages of Fitch? If we select this one right here, like so. We're gonna have a really clean front view and a really clean back view, but we are gonna see the seam up here. And later on, if we're doing some texturing, we might see how the texture doesn't like properly follow this uh, section right here. So that might break a little bit of the realism. However, since the grain of the wood would be normally cut right there, I don't care that much about that one. If we were to select this line on the other side, as you can see, first of all, we would need to like actually manually go here and select the proper line. And, um, and the distortion that the, we would get from this like hanging piece would be a little bit too much. So in this particular case, for this like heart shaped piece, I think this one is the better right there. And that's it. So the cut is ready. Now, the last piece that we need to take a look at are these pieces right here. And uh, long cylindrical pieces are always, always tricky. Why? Because they actually have a lot of surface area. If you think about this, even though they look tiny, they actually have a lot of faces that have some surface area. And that means that that surface area has to be represented on some specific places. So the best thing you can do is when you have really, really long pieces, instead of just doing like cap, cap and across, which by the way, would be the proper way to do this, like just go here. 3D cut, we already have the caps right there, they're open. We just double click right here. Like let's double click back here again so that we hide this and then just cut one cap. Like that would be the proper way to cut things. But if we unfold this, we're gonna have some super, super long stripes and then having very long stripes makes it a little bit difficult to scale things properly here on the UV set. So sometimes it's fine to cut a couple of, uh, uh, cut in a couple of places for our UVs so that we get again, the best possible result. So in this case, I'm gonna go to the corners right here. So that one, that one, like here in the center, it's a good idea, even though it's a little bit visible and that one. And that way we're gonna have, oh, of course, uh, this one over here. That way we're gonna have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sections. And that's gonna give me more space here on my UV editor once we do the unfold thing. And uh, it's just gonna behave a lot, a lot nicer. So there we go. Now we finish with the second step of our element. I actually, I'm gonna write the steps for here, here for you as well, guys. So first step, delete UVs. Second step would be to do a camera UV projection. And the third step, which is the one that we just did, is cut the UVs. Now, as I mentioned, there is an option right here on the on the UV uh, thing when it's open, which is this second option right here, which will give your objects color. So if I go into, into 3D Cut and Sew UV Tool right here, you're gonna see that each individual piece that's a different island will have a different color. So that's how I know how many sections we're gonna have, because as you can see, these cuts that I added right there are changing the colors of the elements. Sometimes the kernels are really close together, but as you can see, like most of them have a different color. Again, it's this little section right here. Some people don't like to work with it. Uh, I personally find it like useful. Uh, so if you don't, just uh, just remove it, but it's this option right here, which is called a shade, okay? So yeah, that's it. Now we go to the one of the easiest and one of the most fun pieces of the puzzle here of the UV creation, which is Unfold. Unfold, it's an amazing tool that Maya has. They actually bought it out from another software several years ago, and uh, they've implemented on the software for a long time now, and it's just super, super, super useful. I'm gonna right click this object, go into Q, and select all of the UVs. Just select everything. And then I'm gonna go into Modify and select 
uh, down here unfold all the way around here. The shortcut is control U if you're already familiar with this one. And the unfold has a couple of options that we can like check. Now, the first thing I'm going to check is I'm going to check the, the room space to a 4K map so that we get a little bit of a, of a nicer, cleaner effect. And other than that, we just need to make sure that the Unfold 3D plugin is turned on. If your Unfold 3D plugin is not turned on, make sure to go to Windows, Settings and Preferences, and Plugin Manager, and you're going to look for uh, Unfold. It's going to be this one right here. As you can see, mine is set to auto load because I use it all the time and um, it's, it's just so useful. So just keep that one on. And when we hit apply, what's going to happen is now every single piece has been kind of like pressed down. Imagine like a like a big uh, like this construction trucks goes over the whole object and it just flattens and out. Well, that's exactly what happened here. And here's where you're going to start seeing your first like signs of alarm. If you see that an object is not unfolding properly, like things are mangled up or they're like twisted or something, that probably means that you're missing cuts. You need to cut a little bit more in another in another in other places to make sure that things unfold in the best possible way. The last part of this uh, puzzle is the layout. So I'm going to grab everything here again. I'm going to go into tools or sorry, modify. And there's this option called layout. And this is one of those secret weapons that not a lot of people know about or don't exploit as, as nicely as they should. And uh, it allows you to create some very nice packs here inside of uh, inside of Maya without having to do a lot of manual work. So the first thing is I'm going to say packing resolution. Let's say this to 4096. Pack together, we want every single object to be right here. And this is this is the most important part, the, the shell pre-transform settings. So shell pre-rotation, it's asking us if we want to if we want to rotate the shells so that they match the orientation of the 3D model. In this case, yes, I want to do that and I want to align them to the vertical axis. And then the shell pre-scaling, which I would say is one of the most important tools in this in this little um, option right here, will make sure that all of your polygons, remember rule number two, I think that was rule number two, all of the polygons should have the same density, okay? So now here in the layout settings, again, just change this to, two, uh, to 496, there we go. Down here, shell padding is the distance in pixels that I want from one shell to the other. I'm gonna set this to four. And tile padding is the distance we want the islands to be away from the borders of our tile. In this case, I'm going to say eight. That's like usually my magic numbers for this. And I'm going to hit apply. So now what's going to happen is this. All of the islands are going to like move around and they're going to rotate and switch directions so that they face this specific element. Now, I think vertical didn't work as I was intending. So I'm going to select this and change this to horizontal and do this again. Just uh, hit apply. And there we go. That's a little bit closer to what I was looking for. And that's it. So as you can see, there's enough distance in between the islands. It packed the whole thing in the best possible way to, to use the most resolution uh, as you can, the most resolution possible. And uh, we are pretty much ready to go into the next section, which is going to be our uh, preparation before we jump into Substance Painter. Now, there's one more thing I want to do this, but I'm going to do this in the next video. So make sure to get all the way to this point if you're following along. And I'll see you back in the next one. Bye-bye. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of this uh, chapter. Today we're going to continue with baking the maps. We're going to jump in, jump into Substance Painter. But before we do that, I do want to do a little bit of a changes here. And this is, it's going to be a little bit difficult to understand right now because we're not seeing the textures. But uh, hopefully with my explanation, things are going to be a little bit clearer. So one thing that's really, really important with wood sculptures and with wood things is the grain of the wood. So if you take a look like at the, at the table or something, like wood table you're going to see that the grain of the wood, that means the direction of the wood is always going towards the longer section. That's going to give the wood more resistance. It's not going to break as easily and it just looks nicer. So you're usually going to have the grain of the wood going to the same uh, direction. Okay. Now, if you take a look here, the both like shapes of the heart shapes of the mask, they're, they're going in the same direction. So if I were to place a texture, a wooden texture and have the grain going from top to bottom, as you can see, it will work perfectly fine. However, it would not work perfectly fine for the spikes and it would not work perfectly fine for these guys right here because they're going in different directions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of the islands here and kind of like playing Tetris, I'm just going to start grabbing them and with W and E, I'm just going to start rotating them so that they I get them in the 90 degree uh, like area. So for instance, all of this, let's push them up. Remember, the rules of, of UVs here inside of the of the UV tile is you don't want UVs to touch each other, like the UV uh, like islands right here. As you can see, there's enough distance. They're super packed together, which is fine. But you don't want to you don't want them to touch each other, and you don't want to touch the borders either. You want to remain as far away from the borders as possible. 
There we go. So those lines now are going from top to bottom. And I know that if we have uh, wood grain, they're going to follow the wood grain properly. The eyes, uh, not much we can do about those. So I'm going to keep them there. Should be fine, though. I'm going to get them in places where they uh, save as much space as possible. And then for this ones, the only thing they, they don't need to be like all pointing up. Like we can we can point some of them up and some of them down, but we definitely want them all to be pointing up and down, right? Because that's going to be like the main direction of the wood grain. And that way, uh, when we project a texture on top of them, the texture is going to look nice. Now, since they all have like different directions, it's a little bit more of a manual process that we have to do here. We can't just automate it, but believe me, this is going to be more than use, more than more, more than enough for what we need. Now, while I'm finishing these things, uh, there's one uh, one new concept that I need to talk about, and that is the uh, games versus like cinematics approach, right, or, or commercials approach. If we're doing things for a cinematic, we shouldn't take the resolution of the uh, like the resolution of the models shouldn't be bothering us. Like we can work with millions of polygons, and it should be completely fine. If we're working for games, though, uh, we do need to be a little bit more optimized on the way we prepare our models. So since this one, I want to show you uh, the rendering here inside of Maya. Uh, I'm not going to worry that much about our models, okay? So I'm going to go right here. Or actually, I'm going to go out of the UV editor for one second. And I'm actually going to smooth this guy out. So I'm going to say mesh and smooth. That's going to change the topology. It's going to make it softer. It's kind of like if we were going into number three mode, right? Into smooth mode. But it's also going to change the UV. So as you can see, the UVs did change slightly over here. And sometimes the unfold doesn't work as nicely. So I'm going to grab everything here. I'm going to press Control U. So Control U should unfold things. And as you can see, now things look a lot nicer. That the silhouette and everything is following. We don't really need to change any of the of the pro like the elements. You just need to be very careful not to have anything going into like in a different direction. Because since we did change um, a little bit of like the structure of the elements, things could have moved a little bit. So just do a double check and make sure that nothing is like really doing it uh, any problem. And the reason why I do this after the fact, because uh, we could have uh, smoothed it out before doing the UVs, it's usually easier to find the UVs of an object before you do uh, or before you have high high resolution. So yeah, that's it. So, uh, freeze transformation, delete history of, of center pivot, everything. Uh, Madras mass is a good name. All of these groups we don't need. Let's delete them. And there we go. Now, one thing I do like to do before going into, um, into substance is I like to assign a new material to the object because I, because I know that this material is the one that we're going to be using to eventually build up the Arnold material that we're going to be using for the final render. So I'm going to say uh, right click. I'm going to assign a new material, Arnold, and we're going to do a AI standard or it's just a little bit like no sorry let's do a maya lambert material there we go and this lambert material is going to be called m majoras mask there we go that way it's very it's a very unique name and we're not going to have any issues i'm going to say file export selection and i'm going to export this selection to our assets folder that's usually the the place where i like to export and i recommend exporting in fbx that's usually the the best one for for this sort of thing so i'm just going to call this majoras Majora's Mask. There we go. Now, uh, some of you might remember, we've already done this Majora's Mask in other uh, time. I, I actually did a, a, a tutorial or explanation on how to do this inside of uh, other software, which is a Marmoset. Uh, but now I'm going to show you why Substance is so powerful. Uh, Marmoset is a really good software, don't get me wrong, but I mean, Substance in texturing is just uh, a little bit ahead of the, of the game. So we're going to go File, New, and I'm going to select 4K Textures because we really want to push this into the next level. And let's go real quick to our assets right here. And this is the one. OpenGL doesn't really matter. Uh, we just hit OK, and there we go. So the first thing we need to do is we need to bake this thing. We need to create the bakes so that we can... Um, what's the word so that we can start working with all of the things that we need. And some of you might be wondering, well, how is it that we're going to be baking things if we don't have a high poly? This is the high poly, right? Well, the thing about uh, substance is that even though you don't have a high poly, you can still extract information from the model. So you can extract pretty much every single thing here, but some of those things are not going to be as, as important, right? In this case, the only thing that I want to extract are world space normal, position, curvature, ambient occlusion, and thickness. And even though we get that warning sign like, hey, you need a high poly to get this information, 
you actually don't. It's just a warning so that you know that you might need it, but you don't actually need it. So it's a nice little secret there. Let's take a look at this. As you can see, that's the bake. That's normal, workspace normal. There's no information there, that's fine. But look at this ambient occlusion. Even though we don't have a high poly, we do have ambient occlusion because the, the geometry itself is creating the ambient occlusion that we need, okay? Now, there's a very important map that you're missing here or that we're missing here. And hopefully, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I would like to thank anyone that's watching this right now because you guys are about to see an amazing secret to creating masks here inside of Substance Painter, which is called the ID map. So the ID map is one of those misunderstood maps inside of the 3D world. People like don't really know what they are at first until someone explains it to you. So hopefully after this, you guys are gonna be masters about the ID map. The ID map is nothing more than a color map that you use to create masking information, okay? So for instance, if you have like really complex model like this one right here, you can assign specific RGB colors to different sections of it. And then it's gonna be a lot easier to select those areas because instead of selecting the faces or the polygons or the UVs, you select the colors and the colors are gonna mask out the areas that they're assigned to. It works really, really, really well when you have like a really complex character like this one. Imagine having to like manually paint the spiral right there on this character's shoulder. It will be just a, a total mess. It will be very, very difficult to do so. But if you know how to use ID maps, then it's gonna be a lot easier. And today I'm gonna show you how to do that. So let's go into Maya because we're actually gonna be doing this in Maya. And we're gonna be using this mesh display option right here. I'm gonna go into the object. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all of the spikes. So I'm gonna select all of the spikes. I'm going to face mode and just pressing shift and double click to select all of those islands. And then if we go here to vertex color, we can apply a color. Uh, vertex can save a lot of information. They're like really, really like, uh, what's the word? Uh, they're really flexible elements here in the 3D world. And besides knowing their position, rotation, and scale, well, their, their position in space, they can also save a color for, for themselves. So I'm going to select this color right here. I'm going to select like the green color. And uh, I'm just going to say apply color. And now, as you can see, all of the spikes are green. Now I can select at the main body of the element, going to apply color. Let's change the color to this like red color. I'm gonna say apply and the body is red. I can select the eyes, select another color like the yellow and hit apply. And then I can select the little like um, circular things here, the, the, the tubes, go here, select like the uh, magenta color and hit apply. And now as you can see, every single part of the Majora's Max has a different ID color. So I'm gonna select everything again. I'm gonna say file, export selection once again into the same file that we have right here. Let's go yes. And now we actually do need to have a high poly. The ID map is one of those maps that you definitely need a high poly map. So I'm gonna say bake mesh map. I'm gonna turn everything off except for the ID map because everything else is working fine. We just need the ID map. And I'm gonna add the same file as my ID information. The only thing that I'm gonna change is I'm gonna change the ID right here and I'm gonna change that from material color to vertex color, very important. And now I'm gonna say bake selected textures. And what's gonna happen is, as you can see there, we got this map with information, with color information being extracted from the file that we just gave a substance painter. So isn't that impressive? Pretty cool, right? So yeah, now we're gonna start with the basics color. So just give me one second. Very well. So the next step, of course, is to jump onto the actual like building up the S. Let me move this down here. I actually like my U UI to be uh, down here. Uh, but before we do that, I, I just want to show you a, a couple of things that are going to be important for our uh, setup. So first of all, if you go up here to the little display settings, this is the, the thing that we're normally using to, to shade and to see the, how the materials are going to react. If we turn the environment opacity all the way up and we lower the environment blur, as you can see, right now the Majora's Mask is in this sort of like forest, hill, something. And um, it's fine. However, I do recommend when you're texturing, especially props, that you go down here and use one of this studio photos. I really like using this, for instance, this uh, soft one low. Um, and the reason why I recommend this one is if you're, if you're texturing on a HDR that has a lot of color information, like this one, for instance, this is like Mars or something, there's a lot of orange, right? And a lot of, of uh, warm colors. So if you're texturing in this sort of scenario, then your eye and your mind will immediately compensate against those warm colors. And you're going to try to do things a little bit more into the cool realm to make sure that they're balanced. Uh, same thing if you go for like this sort of like cool green effect, you're going to go a little bit warmer on your colors. So if you want to avoid that, one very easy way is either get a, a studio that has 
like a very neutral light like this one. I'm not, I don't remember if I download this one of this one that's included or just just one of this basic ones that has no color information because again, you don't want to be texturing with uh, with things like this where they're going to be affecting the way you see your object, right? It might look really cool and later on we might use it for like a quick render, um, but you don't want to use those for, for the basic construction. So in this case, I'm going to be using this studio right here. Quick shortcut for those of you that are learning uh, Substance Painter, shift and right click will rotate your light around. Some people like to see the light, uh, or I mean the HDR and, and see how it's affecting your object. I personally don't. So I'm gonna go here to the opacity and just lower that down. That way I can focus on only the object and not get distracted by the, by the background, okay? So uh, yeah, I think that's it for this one, guys. Like our bakes are ready. So let's go real quick here over to the file section, save this. Let's jump onto my projects here. Let's go in here. Save it here on the on the on the assets folder as well. And uh, yeah, we're ready to start creating the basic textures for our Majora's mask. So make sure to get all the way to this point, and I'll see you back on the next video. Bye bye. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of this special series. Today we're going to continue with the basic texture construction. I actually misspelled the word there on the, <laughs> it says construction, but it's uh, construction. We're going to start building the basic layers. So in order to do that, of course, one of the best things we need to do is we need to get some reference. So I'm going to look for Majora's Mask right here. And uh, I mean, the, the good thing about this model is that it's very obvious what we want to do, right? Like this is what we want. We already know the kind of like uh, the kind of uh, effect and elements that we want. Now, from what I can tell, I mean, in the original game, you didn't really know about this. But from what I can tell, these things could be bones or, or we can interpret those as bones or we can interpret those as um, what's the word as as wood. I think I'm going to interpret those as wood. So basically, we need a basic wood uh, option. We can go here to the wood options, and as you can see, I have uh, some of the basic woods that we normally get, like this wood rough, uh, rotten wood, uh, wood American cherry, uh, and I have some other more premium ones. Uh, I'm pretty sure some of you guys know, but if you get the indie license of uh, Substance, with Substance uh, Source and all that stuff, uh, you get access to this thing called uh, Substance 3D Assets. And uh, there's a lot of wood materials here that are really good. I, I actually think they are. So this rotten wood that I got here, this is from the... Um, from this side. So if you can, if you can uh, get access to this, that would be great because as you can see, like we have access to really, really, really nice woods like this list, this, this uh, oak uh, aged walnut wood looks really, really good. Let me show you how to download this real quick. So once you're um, like loaded in, just, just download this uh, SVSR, which is an archive. And uh, if you have this one right here, you just move this into substance, drop it right here define it as a base material and import it to either your current session or your library. I like to import it to my library so that I have, have, so that I have access to it whenever I need to. And uh, that's it. So now we can again look for wood, for instance. And these are all the things related to wood. Let's go to the materials. And here we go. This is the H walnut wood. Now, you guys might not have access to all of this. Don't worry. If you don't, try working with either the wood rough or the wood walnut or the wood americana. Remember that all of these ones also have uh, a couple of things. I'm actually going to start with the wood americana just so that you guys see what I mean. And then I'll show you how to, uh, how to manipulate it. So the first thing you are going to do whenever you're working with a wood material is you want to make sure that the grain of the wood is going in the direction that you want. Right now, this is not. So I'm going to go here to the rotation right here. If you select the material and you go down to the proper you can change the rotation and I can change the rotation so that it's facing up like this and now as you can see everything is following a nice like direction like on all of the spikes and stuff they're, they're following nicely and um, and that makes it look a lot more realistic because as I've say it said so many times before the wood grain should always follow or try to follow the longest uh, section of your uh, wood a piece so you can like manually input here nine degrees and that's going to give you as closer as it can get if you're using a, a wood material that has the grain or the grain is really small or really big, you can also change the scale here. The lower the scale, <coughs> sorry, the bigger the divisions are going to be and the bigger the scale, well, the more banding you're going to have. In this case, I don't think we need as many. But as I mentioned, I'm not going to be using this ones. I'm going to be using some of this other ones like this uh, edge walnut, which I think is going to be really, really good. Look at that. Yeah, that looks really, really cool. Now let's again move this thing, rotate this thing so that it's uh, facing up. And this definitely needs a little bit more uh, scale. So I'm going to push the scale. Let's try two and see how that looks. 
that doesn't look that bad however i'm not completely fond of the change in the in color like the color right now it's a little bit too too crazy i would say sometimes yeah like here wood color variation we can bring this down for instance like this material allows us to to like Bane's contrast is that working there we go so that's a little bit closer to what i would like um most materials here inside of substance will have some options that you can change but I, honestly I'm, I'm not loving this one like i downloaded it just to show you how to download it but uh, i don't think it's gonna work so i'm gonna delete that one and i know for a fact that the rotten wood is gonna work because i've used this one before and it's really really good so same thing we're gonna rotate this 90 degrees so it's facing down like this and i actually think the distance that we have like the size of the elements is fairly nice maybe just a little bit more oh actually three looks amazing yeah three looks really really good look at that detail pretty cool however here's one secret and this is a little bit more advanced but i'm sure you guys are going to appreciate it and um and and like it of course we can actually see the displacement because right now we're not seeing displacement even though we can activate the high channel right here for the for the element there we go so with the high channel enable as you can see we get a little bit more depth on the element but we're not really pushing the geometry as you can see the geometry is still like right there so we can go to the options right here to the shader settings and down here we can enable something called a displacement right now oh it was enabled okay so let's enable this okay no so it is enabled the scale is enabled however what's not enabled is the um what's the word the uh, tessellation so we're not dividing this guy and since we're not dividing it we're not getting any like change in resolution there we go let's go back here so here are the scale let's bring it down and i'm gonna start adding tessellation method which is a subdivision it's kind of like subdividing or adding more geometry to the object and that way now we're gonna see the wood like poking up and down and we can again play around a little bit with the height so it's not as intense now don't worry all of this we're gonna eventually um like modify it inside of maya so it looks a little bit better but this one like this i think already looks quite 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 nice so if we take a look at the reference where's the reference this thing is uh, made out of wood like i really like this one i think this was from a frame from a like cinematic they dated a couple of years ago and uh it's painted right like the mask is going to be painted but right now this thing right here works very very nice as this sort of like base for the for the whole uh for the whole thing so this is going to be my basic uh layer now the little spikes on on the on this guy's body as you can see they're all yellow i know that all they're all going to be yellow they're going to be like uh, either painted or, or kind of like pigmented in this sort of like yellow wood they could also be like a different kind of wood like it could be like an old wood for the mainframe and then like a nicer cleaner wood for the for the spikes right so what i'm going to do is maybe now it might be a good idea to use this like wood rough i'm going to go here on the top and this wood rough is going to be added to only the spikes now we have a problem as you can see this guy right here is already applying the effect to everything so we need to add a mask i'm going to right click this guy and i'm going to add a black mask and then with my number four which is a fill mode i'm going to say where i want this thing to be and right now i only want this thing to be actually on the main body of the of the elements i'm going to change the polygon selection on the main body and on the eyes that's the only piece where i want that like rotten wood to be everything else is going to be the new wood so for this one i'm going to say right click add a black mask and we're going to same thing fill everything else with a black mask right here and now as you can see we have two different I'm going to press number one there we have two different woods on the character and that's also going to give us a very interesting look i'm going to go to this one and i definitely want to increase the scale a little bit so we see a little bit more fibers more knots and stuff that's very cool i like that one that's 13 let's go back to 10 so we have like a like a whole easy number to remember and there we go now this paint we know that this paint is going to have a little bit of a yellow tint to it right so i think i'm going to be using a paint so i'm going to go into paint or plastic sorry i'm going to go into plastic i'm going to use this plastic uh, matte uh, element right here and you add black mask go into number four and now instead of uh yeah no in this case let's just paint all of the spikes so i'm just gonna again using my fill layer paint all of these spikes in this case a blue and of course we're gonna change this thing not to blue 
but of this sort of like mustard yellow thing. Like this. There we go. Now, this looks really ugly. It looks like it's just an overlay uh, paint, right? Here's what we can do. I do want to keep my roughness. Like, I do want to have some control over the roughness of the paint. And I do want it to be a little bit shiny, like what we have right now. But I would like the colors to kind of like uh, permeate throughout the wood and, and be absorbed by it so that we can see the colors of the wood. So we can go here to the base color and change the options to something like an overlay. And look at that. The overlay is now going to combine the colors of the wood, which were this like dark brown colors, and the colors of this paint to this uh, sort of like very nice old mustard look. Now we can increase the intensity here. We want to bring a little bit more color into the game. And as you can see, that's going to start giving us a very, very cool vibe. And we're going to do the same thing for the for the other uh, part of the mask. So as you can see, the main color of the mask is this sort of like purple uh, that we have pretty much everywhere. So the best thing would be to go down here to the rotten wood, add another plastic mat right there, change the color to this sort of like purple, and also change this to an overlay. And look at that. Pretty, pretty cool, right? Pretty cool base for the element. I think it's a little bit shiny, so I'm going to increase the roughness just a tad bit. There we go. Now let's take a look at the reference again. Um, other important color is going to be the black for the lines, and the eyes have this sort of like, again, it's also like yellowish. Well, more like more like orangey, right? So let's add those already. Uh, on top of this one, I'm going to add another plastic mat. This is going to be just a dark color black mask let's feel those lines right there there we go and let's add one more black mask oh wait sorry i did a fill layer let's just drag and drop this one right here let's change this to like an orange there we go black mask and fill the eyes and there we go now of course this one's we're, this one especially the orange we're definitely going to change this to like an overlay but as you can see, the overlay, one of the problems with the overlay is that it darkens the color and the eyes are supposed to be glowing. So I'm actually going to change this to a multiply, or sorry, a divide, linear dutch, linear dutch, this one. And we can lower the intensity here a little bit so we can get like a nice base. And later on, we're going to change the uh, the actual colors of the element. And uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. As you can see, we got all of this very, very nice little details and our mask is looking quite, quite nice for this basic uh, construction. Now, before we move on, uh, I definitely want to start adding a couple of uh, details because we, of course, need to paint all of the different patterns that we have here uh, with, uh, with the mask, like all of these elements. We do have some like uh, holes that we need to create as well, like those little like black holes right there. And, uh, and we need to paint everything. So how, how are we going to fix this? Well, uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to give it a little bit of uh, dirt, I think. Dirt's going to be really, really important, and most of the other details are going to be on top. For the dirt things, I really like using a rust layer, even though this is not metal, so it wouldn't rust. I'm going to add a rust layer here on top. I'm going to right-click, add a black mask, right-click, and we're going to add something called a generator. Generator are these things that allow you to utilize certain, like, tips and tricks inside of uh, Substance to generate a very dynamic and very cool looking mask. So we're going to use this thing called the dirt mask right here. And what's going to happen, as you can see, is we're going to get a dirt and, and, and grime pretty much in all of the crevices of the object. Now, I never, ever, ever, ever leave my mask like this. I always, always change this to an overlay or something similar so we can get some darker colors on those areas. And you can see how much this mask helps, as you can see right there. It really adds a lot of depth and, uh, and definition to our masks. So, yeah, uh, I think we're in a really good position right here, guys. I'm going to stop the video, and in the next one, I'm going to show you how to work with paint layers so that we can paint all of the remaining colors that we're missing. So hang on tight, and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye-bye. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. Today we're going to continue with paint layer, which are a really powerful uh, tool here inside of Substance that we're going to be using, of course, to paint this uh, colors that we're missing for the Majora's Mask. So the Majora's Mask has uh, three main colors that we're missing. We have an orange color, we have a red color, we have the white decals. Well, actually, there's more than three colors. So what I'm going to do is uh, below this mask right here, which uh, the rust is always going to be on top of almost everything. But right here, I'm going to add a new fill layer, okay? And I'm going to select the red color that we're going to be using for the main effects. We can actually already set this to overlay. Uh, so that we can get an idea of how this thing is going to look. And right now, of course, this thing is uh, like if we if we have both the, the purple and everything else on top of this, it's this um, 
it's kind of like transferring, right? Like we're overlaying this this red on top of the purple and that might not be what we want. So first of all, let's go to the purple color and I'm gonna get rid of the purple where we don't need it. So I'm gonna add a black or I'm gonna add a white mask rather, right click, add white mask. And with my brush, I'm just gonna paint out where I don't want the purple color to be. Now, to make this a little bit faster, I'm gonna turn on this option right here, which is symmetry. And that, as you can see, will allow me to very, very quickly paint out all of the purple from this area, specifically this area, because this is the area that I know that the red color is gonna be like occupying. Actually, same thing for the eyes. Like we don't wanna have any sort of like extra colors like pushing the, the values. There we go. And that's it. I'm not sure if it's not affecting the spike, so that's fine. Uh, and yeah, there we go. So there's no more red color where we want the red color to be. Now we can turn on the red color and we're also gonna add a black mask. And now again, with symmetry turned on, we're gonna start painting all of this. Now, don't worry about the eyes. I'm gonna show you a quick way in which we can unpaint them very quickly. So let's go around the eyes, even though we're, we're painting a little bit of them. All of this area we go down here. Don't worry about the spikes either. So there we go. Now that red color looks really, really creepy, really nice. It kind of looks like blood. So I'm actually going to leave it like this. I was thinking about like changing the overlay a little bit here, like this or something. But I think it, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. Now, how do we get rid of this one? Well, we can actually go to number uh, four again, which is fill layer. And we can change the fill layer to black so that we hide everything. And then we go into geometry. We just click the eyes and the spikes. And that's your, that just removes the, the, the red color from them. And uh, that's it. Uh, yeah, so that color that you see there, that has to be something else. Or or maybe I forgot, no, you know what that is? It's the rust, so that's fine. So yeah, that's the, that's the red color, looking quite, quite nice if I may say so myself. Now we have also, if you take a look here at the, the Majora's masks as well, we have this like uh, orange section on top here, right? With this like icons and stuff. And they're like bordered by this black line. And the thing is, we already have black and, uh, and, per and orange right here, right? We have this orange base color for the eyes and, and we also have the black color. So it might be a good idea to just recycle that layer to, to keep the, the file light, but we can also just add another field layer and you can actually go here and we can sample like I can go outside of substance and sample the exact color of orange, which is this one right here. And I'm going to say add black mask again. And we're going to paint the section where this thing is going to be, which is it goes like all the way to this area right here. And it goes around this area and it goes at about there like this. Now, I would imagine that it does not cross over to this like back section. So I'm gonna clean this back section. I press the X there to switch from black to white on my brush. And uh, it's supposed to be a little bit like firmer. So I'm just gonna like really create the border there for the element. So try to get rid of that like soft effect by making the brush a little bit smaller. And that's gonna give me a sharper, way, way sharper cut right there. Maybe a little bit less. There we go. Now, same trick, we can press four and just get rid of the spikes right there. Just fill them with another color and that's it. Um, this thing's actually a little bit thinner because we have a couple of symbols that we're still missing on this section right here. So on this section, we have this sort of like triangular, like the base of the triangle is right here. And then it kind of goes like this and down like this. Now it's it's supposed to be like hand painted. So even if the shapes are not perfect, I think we're good. Like this. And then this one's a little bit more like a like a longer triangle. Like this. Because over here, we're gonna have a, a white arrow that goes uh, along this like surface. I'll talk about the white arrow in just a second. 
Now I'm going to go back to the black one, this one right here, and I actually need to move this thing up, like uh, 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 on top of this element, because if we want to do the black line right here, it needs to follow on top of the element. Now, my pulse is really bad. I have a really, really shaky pulse. Uh, some of you guys might know that I, I wanted to be a doctor before I uh, became a 3D artist. I never wanted to be a surgeon though, because I knew I couldn't make it. <laughs> yeah, my pulse is just not uh, meant for that. I'm, I'm really, I have a really, really shaky pulse. So what we can do here, what I can do here is I can turn on this thing, which is called lazy mouse. And lazy mouse allows me to draw ahead of the line. And that's gonna keep my pulse a lot more control as you can see right there. So I can just click and once the like black circle reaches the next section, that's when we're gonna start drawing the line. And as you can see, that's the that's the line and the section that we're gonna be drawing. And that's it. Now we have a couple of uh, like black sections right here. I'm actually gonna turn off uh, lazy mouse for this one. The first one is like right here. Oh, you can also press shift. That's another one. Click shift and then move it. And it's going to give you a straight line. So click shift and move it. Click shift and move it. And we just fill all of this area. That's the first one. And then there's another one right here. Beautiful. Looks good. And since we have symmetry turned on, we're saving ourselves a lot of time because we're doing it on both sides at the same time. Now in this area, we have another four of this. So it's like one, and then two, three, again, just be very patient here. This takes time, so be patient with yourself. And with the work, we need to respect the time as well. And that's it. We have the the four main like black sections of the of the Majora's Mask there on top. Um, now I do think that the plastic, that this black one, can be a little bit shinier. So we can actually like see the glow right there. See so the difference between this one. This one could be a little bit rougher. And this is gonna give us a nice contrast once we hit those areas. So the the dark color is gonna look a little bit better. I think that's uh, that's helpful. Now let's talk about the um, this like sections. We're still missing the white ones, of course. The white lines. We'll we'll do those uh, very soon. Uh, but we're missing those dots, right? Like we have dots that we did not model, but that we can actually add as new pieces here. How do we do this? Well, we're going to be doing this with the height channel, which is eventually going to be trans uh, transposed or, or, or transformed into both displacement and normal map information. So I'm going to press this button right here, which is the field layer. I'm going to turn off uh, metal and normal. We just want color, roughness, and height. The color is going to be black. And the height is going to be low. The roughness, we can keep it like this for now. I'm going to add a black mask. And now, if I were to like place some dots right here, you can see that this, those things are actually pushing the geometry. They're pushing the geometry because of the displacement. And they're pushing it and creating the kind of like borders that we want. Now, to make this thing a lot nicer, I'm going to go to my brushes and I'm going to select this basic heart. So it's like a super, super intense like dot right there. And I can actually go here to the height again and just push this thing like even further. And you can see how that thing eventually with the displacement is going to be going like really, really deep, which is closer to what we want. We still have uh, symmetry turned on. And that, of course, is going to allow us to uh, draw all of them at the same time. So we have two right there and then we have one, two, three and four down here. Look at how nice that looks, right? Pretty pro, right? Not freaking bad. And then over here, these ones are a little bit smaller. And we have one, two, and three. And then up here, we have one, two, th three as well. Yes, three, three like horizontal lines. So we're going to go one, two, and three. And remember, all of that things, it looks like we're actually carving because we are. The height information will actually carve into the geometry and it will look like those things actually exist there with uh, with polygons and geometry. But we did all of this inside of the texture. And well, that's why substance is so powerful. And that's why you should uh, learn uh, the full thing about substance. So make sure to check the, the full course as well. 
so yeah that's the that's the main thing now let's go one more uh one more layer here we're gonna add another uh, fill layer this is gonna be the white lines i'm gonna say add a black mask this is gonna be on top of the red lines as well because we definitely need to add this let me grab my basic soft again so we have a little bit of uh of uh, variation and we definitely want to use a spacing because again my pulse is not that great so we're going to start here at the center move out it's actually a little bit smaller i'm, gonna, I'm pressing control and then uh moving my right mouse left and right so to change the space it's a really important shortcut so this one goes up in this sort of like direction and then it kind of like moves to the side oh, let's try that again so it moves out, and once it hits the sort of like apex, it starts moving down and keeping a nice spacing right there. And I'm going to turn this off for just a second and then just erase that piece right there. That's it. And then we have another one that goes from here. It goes around. Oh, missed a curvature there. Let's try that again. And then it stays really close to this one. I'm going to stop right there because I, I don't have enough pulse to go all the way. And then we're just going to continue this one. It goes really close there. Creates a nice like spike right there. And then from there, we go back down like that. And then up here, of course, we have the nice little arrow. Sorry about my dog. He goes crazy sometimes. So the arrow is kind of like a fat arrow going in like this. It touches the center point. And then it goes out. It goes around and then goes to the center of the face. I'm also going to stop my pulse right there. Keep going, keep going. And we do this sort of like round thing right there. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And that's it. That's the, that's the wide uh, effects that we have here. Um, so, uh, other than that, we're just missing the eye color and uh, I'm going to show you this one right now because it's, uh, it's really fun. So if you remember, we used this one for the eyes, this one, I'm actually going to delete it and I'll show you why I'm going to go all the way up here. I'm going to create a new, but in this case, it's not going to be a filler. It's going to be a paint layer. I'm going to change my uh, brush to a basic, uh, hearth right here. And I'm going to turn off this one, actually a, a basic soft. And we're just going to start painting with the base colors that I have here on the reference. So when you're working with a paint layer, this is not a layer that you're going to be able to edit as easily, but you're going to have way, way more control. So right now I don't want to paint anything, but metal and uh, sorry, but color. I just want to paint color, color information. Actually, let's paint roughness as well. I'm going to paint roughness of 0.4. So I'm going to go here to the, to the elements. I'm going to grab this point and I'm going to grab the first like red color that we have here for the eyes, which is this one. And I'm going to paint the eyes. Don't worry about any other area. We're fine. We're going to mask those out. So that's the first color of the ice. And then we have this sort of like orangey color. So we're going to paint it right there. Now, as, I, as I'm saying, or as I mentioned, this is a paint layer. So we're not going to be able to erase. If you make a mistake, you're going to have to paint again. There's no going back. Now we're going to go with the yellow. And the yellow is going to go right there. Look at how nice that looks. And then we have the actual eye. So I'm going to go closer here because we really need to be careful here. I'm going to press control and push this up because this is going to give me a, a harder effect. We're going to start with black paint because black paint, actually not that rough a little bit. I'm going to press control and bring the mouse down. So I have a little bit of fading and we're going to paint black eye. As nice as possible inside of the line, kind of like if we were in kindergarten again. <laughs> And we're just going to grab now the green color. And we're going to leave a very nice thin line on the eyes. I'm actually going to bring this thing down a little bit more so it's a little bit softer. 
and then we have this nice transition. You can do this with a Wacom tablet, by the way. I'm using my mouse, mouse, mouse right now. My mice, mouse. I'm using my mouse. I'm going to go into yellow, this like lemon yellow. I'm going to add a little bit of variation there on the, on the center of the eye because now we're going to go back to black and this is going to be the final like black touch. And look at that. Like a very, very bright color uh, overall. Uh, yes, we can change this to like linear dodge, for instance, to, to increase the, the intensity or to overlay to really darken it, depending on what we want. Um, I think I'm going to actually keep this in, uh, in linear dodge like or, or normal. I'm going to add a uh, white mask and then I'm going to use my uh, fill layer to fill all of the pieces that I accidentally uh, touched. So we only have those color right there. Now I'm seeing the reference and uh, it's a little bit weird because on the, on the cinematic here, the eyes are made out of wood, but on the reference they're made out of like a different material. So feel free to change it. If you want to have like a smooth material, you can also change it. I don't think we need it right now. I think this one's going to work uh, just fine. And uh, yeah, I do think my spikes right there, this one's right now are a little bit too dark. So I'm going to increase the, the color, maybe change this to like linear dodge as well. Or like we can try like a, a linear dodge, but then like reduce the intensity a little bit. I don't know. We need to find we need to find the proper one. Overlay was not looking bad, but I because I, I really like this like dark effect to it. I think it really matches the, the whole concept. So yeah, I'm gonna stop right here, guys. And in the next one, I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, generators that we can use to uh, paint this even better. So hang on tight, and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye bye. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. Today we're going to continue adding some details to our uh, little mask right here. And uh, let's start with adding some of the um, of the actual like colors that we have on the spikes. So if you remember, the spikes have this like paint layers, right? Like red, this is like yellow. Uh, it seems like we don't have anything on the top. So yeah. So I'm going to add another fill layer. You're probably up here as well. Uh, or paint layer, sorry. And we're going to go to the colors and we're going to do the same thing that we did for the eyes. So I'm going to sample this like blue color. But now I'm actually going to change this to like the, I think the cotton one is going to look nice. So we're going to use the cotton. That's going to give us a nice, like a uh, interesting effect here on the, on the element. So that's the blue. And then we're going to sample the green. There we go. And now we're going to sample the red. Just going to go right there. And finally, we have this sort of like yellow. It's like a yellow mustard thing. Like a lot brighter. There we go. And I can kind of actually see that yellow on top here as well. So I might want to add it. And now, of course, we can play around, for instance, like with linear dodge or with overlay and see which colors look the best. That overlay looks amazing. Amazing, amazing. We can also leave it at normal and then just like modify the opacity a little bit. Although, uh, you know which one? Uh, the soft light also works sometimes. Linear dodge is not bad. You can also use your little like mouse uh, or sorry, your what's the word? Your key, your arrow keys to like uh, go through the different layers and see if you find something that looks interesting. Overlay seems to look the, like the darkest, in, most interesting one. I think we're going to go with linear dodge. Or just normal. Is normal too much? I kind of like normal, to be honest. I kind of like normal. The one thing I don't like is uh, in normal, uh, maybe normal with just a little bit of like opacity. That looks interesting. I do think this ones are a little bit too dark. Another thing we can do is we can go here to the wood rough, the original wood, and just like lighten up a little bit. And that's also going to lighten up like every other color that we have, like in the eyes and stuff. I think that could help. Maybe not that light. It's just a small little kick there uh, to, to bring things up. Same for this like rotten wood. Maybe just a little bit of a hit right there. So the colors look a little bit brighter. Because we can darken the whole scene uh, once we're in Maya. Whoa, oh, that's too much. <laughs> we can darken the whole thing one, uh, the whole thing one, once we're in Maya, and uh, I don't think we really need to to bring it here. There we go. So um, I think we're in a really really good position right now. But now it's time that we start scratching or adding some elements to the whole thing, right? To the 
to the to the element kind of like make it seem like uh the wood has uh, chipped some of the paint and stuff and there's a couple of ways to do it we could like start playing with layers here but i want to keep it simple for everyone that's starting their journey here instead of uh, substance painter um so i think one of the easiest ways is to grab the original wood material like this one i'm gonna duplicate it Control d and i'm gonna bring it all the way to the top all the way to the top below the um, the rust but everything else should be uh on the top now I'm gonna get rid of the masks. I'm gonna say add a black mask. I'm gonna add a generator. And this is gonna be a metal edgeware generator. So metal edgeware is one generator that scratches parts where the paint is, like, uh, like the, the strong parts, right? Now the problem right now is that, there we go, that's the kind of effect we want. But the problem right now, it's being very, very aggressive. It's, it's affecting everything in a very like intense and uh, uniform way. And we might not want this thing to be affecting everything, right? So I do like this sort of like effect that we're getting. Uh, one thing I don't like is I don't wanna affect the roughness, or sorry, the height here. So we just wanna affect the color to kind of give this like grunge uh, damaged effect. Usually the wood's a little bit lighter here. So I'm gonna push the light colors a little bit like higher. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of my old tricks. Some of you guys might already know about this one. I'm going to add a field layer. And I'm going to add something like uh, clouds. Like this clouds 3. And then if we increase the balance of this clouds and the contrast, the contrast mainly, what we can do is we can multiply this clouds against the original dirt. And that way, yes, we're going to get some dirt, some like damage pretty much everywhere, but not everywhere. We can also change the scale here to give it more like variation overall. And by modifying the amount of balance and things, we can give it a sort of like damaged effect without actually destroying every single piece of the, of the element. So I really like this effect right here. I am gonna change this to linear dodge and lower the intensity a little bit. And now what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna add a paint layer. And paint layer will allow me to, as if it was a normal layer, get rid of that damage in certain areas that I might not want. So for instance, I don't want any damage on the black areas. I, I think they look good without that sort of like damage. So, so we're going to keep it like that. And uh, if I see that, hey, you know what? Like maybe I don't want damage like over here, we just erase it. Let's get rid of this. And we can just erase some of the damage if it doesn't make sense to have damage everywhere. But as you can see, this nice little layer right there is going to add a lot of life to the whole thing. It's just gonna make it look really, really interesting because now the paint looks like it's uh, chipping a little bit, right? It looks like a, it, has a, it has a little bit more damage than than it should. Um, so that's one of the one of the things that I wanted to do. I wanted to add that sort of like a damage layer. I also want to add some scratches. So for that one, I'm gonna use a fill layer. Uh, I think gray is fine. Black mask, and I can also go to the fill layers here and look for something called scratches. And scratches are really, really, really good because they add, again, this sort of like damaged wood effect. Look at that. Pretty, pretty cool. Um, I'm definitely going to change the color to a little bit more like a like a wood color. There we go. And maybe even change this to like an overlay or like a linear dodge. Linear dodge looks good. And just decrease the intensity a little bit. So that way we add another layer of complexity to the whole thing. And now things are looking really, really, really nice. Now is the time when you can actually go into your uh, elements here and if you want to take a look at how this thing looks on other lighting scenarios, it's a really good like moment to do so because now we actually have colors and we know those colors are not going to change and we could get a better, better, a better view of how this thing is going to look. I really like, for instance, Corsica Beach. It's one of my favorite uh, like HDRs because it's very contrasty and we can get, as you can see, a very, very nice effect overall. Um, let's see, what else can we add? Okay, I'm gonna add two more layers. These are special layers. You might not need them all the time. Let me go back to the, like the soft one. Or not, not that one. Let's go, ah, that's fine. So one layer that I like to do is I like to add an ambient occlusion layer, just to add a little bit more shadow if I need to. So I'm gonna add a field layer. It's gonna be a black mask. It's only gonna affect the color. I only wanna affect the colors here. Maybe the roughness a little bit, that could work. I'm gonna say add black mask. I'm gonna add a field layer. And you can actually reference the same maps that we created when we did the bakes, this ambient occlusion maps, um, to do that. Now, the problem with the ambient occlusion is that it's actually inverted. So I'm going to right-click and hit uh, Add Levels to invert this thing. And now we can play around with this one. And look at that. We can add a little bit of a very, like, fancy dark shadow all around the character. 
we can play around with the with the smoothness of the colors and uh, especially if you're going for this like super creepy vibe i think uh i think it works quite quite nice it also allows you to kind of like blend things together and make a like a nicer effect look at the difference without the ambient occlusion and with ambient occlusion i think it, uh, it's worth it and another one that I like to add, it's a little bit more like artistic decision, but usually things get more like sun bleach on the top part of the elements. So I'm going to add a new feel layer. This is going to be a like a warm, like sun color like this. And I'm going to add a black mask. I'm going to add a generator, and this is called the light generator. The light generator uh, works kind of like if you were like flashing a uh, flashlight towards the character or like spotlight. So in this case, I'm moving this angle so that it's coming straight from the top. And what I can do is I can actually use this to use linear dodge and uh, move this thing like down a little bit to kind of like sun bleach. I'm going to press C to jump into the channels. And you can see how this kind of like sun bleaches a little bit of the upper parts of the elements. It's just a nice little detail that can help give it a little bit more depth. You can see the, the difference there. It's, it's very, very subtle. Now, if you don't want a lot of color, you can also actually just like bring this back to like white and it's going to look like dust. So this also makes it look like a like a dust layer. And uh, yeah, that that's pretty much it, guys. With this one, we're, we're ready to jump on to uh, onto the final part of this mini series, which is getting thing everything, getting everything ready. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say file export textures and we're going to export this onto our source images folder. So let's jump into our uh, premium courses here. Or mini premium source images. I'm going to create a new folder called Majora's Mask. Select that folder and we're going to export this one using the uh, Arnold shader. So Arnold AI standard, that's the one that we're going to use. I usually like to use target files. Uh, they're uncompressed and uh, that's it. And the size is going to be 4K. So just hit export. And as you can see, we're going to get all of this information. Base color, emissive, height, metalness, normal, and roughness. And all of this, if we open the output directory, they're right here. And we're going to be using all of these maps to connect them inside of Maya and get a really, really nice, cool render. So, yeah, hang on tight, and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye-bye. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. Today we're going to talk about rendering and this chapter is going to be a little bit more theoretical, theoretical, theory. We're going to have more theory. So yeah, let's go. Uh, this is the final result of our texturing. Now, uh, remember that at any point we can continue working on this thing, that this doesn't mean that we're done. Uh, there's way, way more things that we can add to make sure things look as nice as possible. Uh, but just to keep this thing brief and easy to follow, I'm going to stop right here. I really like this sort of like grungy effect that we get. And pretty much all of the details look like really, really, really cool. So we're going to go into, into Maya and we're going to, first of all, create a nice lighting scenario for our mask right here so that we can uh, we'll appreciate how all of the elements are going to look. So first of all, I'm going to uh, go here to this option and I'm going to go into Mesh Display. And I want to get rid of the colors. So let's see if we can remove colors. Apply. There we go. So now we don't see anything. We don't have any more vertex color and we can see our element in the normal way. We're going to be using Arnold for our rendering setup. Arnold is one of the best renders out there. It's uh, It comes free with Maya and it's uh, really, really easy to use. And uh, the way we're going to do this is, of course, we are going to reference like a nice shot that we might want to emulate. And then we're going to uh, do it ourselves. So I really like this frame right here from, again, from this shortcut uh, or short that uh, some people did a couple of years ago. And as you can see, we have, of course, a general light scenario. We have a really strong light coming from one side and we have a, like a soft, warm, uh, like cool light coming from this side. So in order to start working with this, one of the first things we can do is we can actually grab something called an HDR. HDRs, uh, for those of you that are not aware of, are this high dynamic range images that we can get that allows us to, to bleed or, or bring information from the image into the 3D world and uh, make it seem like our object is right there. So I'm going to try and look for this sort of like dark uh, place and, and hopefully something with a lot of trees so that it looks like we're in the middle of the forest. Now, I don't recommend using this night uh, ones. Some of them are really difficult to work with because there's a... Uh, there's a lot of noise on the images. So I prefer to work with like an outdoor uh, scene and then lower the exposure to, to get like a, like a dark color. So let's see which one could work well. Uh, let me look for like forest. Maybe we get something in the forest. Yeah, there we go. So some of these ones are looking quite nice. Like this one looks really nice. Uh, 
This one looks really nice as well. This one looks really creepy. For escape. That sounds interesting. So let's download this image real quick. It doesn't really matter. 4K is, is more than fine. And we're going to uh, move this into our source images folder. Remember, every time we're working here inside of Maya, you want to bring things into the source images folder. So I'm going to go into source images, and that's where I'm going to drop it. As you can see right here, it's in source images. And now here inside of uh, inside of Maya, we're going to go into Arnold and we're going to say lights and we're going to create this thing called a sky dome light. The sky dome light is again, this like huge sphere that we're going to be using to map this image that we just downloaded and project all of the light information into our scene. So I'm going to go here into color. I'm going to add a file note into this color. I'm going to click the little uh, folder icon right here and we're going to select our four escape and hit open. So now, as you can see, it's like uh, the mask. Uh, it's pretty much like if the mask was here inside of the scene. I'm going to use rotation to move this. Like I want to have the cape on the back of the of the element. We're actually not going to see the final image, uh, but I just want to like, have this direction. And uh, if we were to go into Arnold and just hit render, like exactly as it is right now, we are going to see all of the light information from this image being projected into the into the scene. And uh, it's going to seem like this uh, Lambert shaded uh, mask is right here on the on the preview. So let's just wait a couple of seconds for the render to start. It usually takes a, like about a 20, 30 seconds, depending on your computer, of course. Let's just wait for this. There we go. And that's it. So now it seems like my ma mask is right there in the middle of the forest, right? Just floating there. And this already looks quite nice. It looks really realistic. It looks very nice. But we're going to make this thing look even better. Now, before we continue, there's a couple of things I want to do. First of all, if you have a, an NVIDIA GPU, you can actually go here to system and change this to GPU compute. Well, uh, that's the, well, in this case, it's just called GPU. And if we were to render now, it's going to take a little bit uh, longer the first time. But once it's done, as you can see, the GPU render is really fast. It's a lot noisier. Uh, as you can see, it's definitely noisier. But the render is really, really fast. It creates this very, very nice effect. Uh, one way to get rid of this noise that we're seeing right now is to add one thing called an imager. Um, I think I did mention this in one of the other like mini premium courses. And uh, here in the imager, we have this thing called the denoiser optics. So I'm going to add this one right here. And now, as you can see, it's it just cleans it. It just cleans, straight up cleans it, and uh, it gives us this very, very nice clean result. Uh, this is using artificial intelligence, by the way. It's like uh, things that I wouldn't even be able to, to explain how it works. I just know it works, and it does an amazing job. So uh, there is a plugin that we can use called the Substance plugin to uh, automatically connect all of the textures into our element. However, I do think it's very useful for everyone to know how to do things manually, just because sometimes you're going to have to connect things that are not like on plugins and stuff. And it's always good to know about this information. So I'm going to go to this option right here, which is called the Hypershade. And here in the Hypershade is where we're going to be building all of the different things that we normally do with uh, materials. Okay. Now, before we jump here, though, let me just minimize this a little bit. Let me just make sure I stop the render because otherwise this thing is going to continue to render. It seems like I did. Now, if you're one of those guys that likes to work with a lot of things like uh, uh, docked into different areas, you can do that as well. Like, for instance, right now I can just get rid of that one for just a second. We can keep the render up here and we can start working on the material over here. So it's up to you. Uh, I usually like to have a little bit more space on my on my stuff. So I'm going to go here to Arnold. I'm going to go to shaders. And I'm going to create this. Uh, uh, I'm going to click on this one called AI standard surface. This is the most basic like material that you're going to find. Pretty much every rendering engine has something similar to this one. And it will allow you to create like a basic well, render sh or render shader. So I'm going to press M or I'm going to write M. I'm going to call this Majora's Mask Arnold because we had another one that was the, the original one. And here is where we're going to start connecting stuff. So there's a couple of ways to connect stuff. I'm going to show you real quick. The first one is here going into base color. Click this option. Click a file node, and it will automatically link the out color of that element to the base color. So we just go to the file node, select this little folder right here, go into our textures, and select our base color texture, which is this amazing texture that we have right here. Hit open, and that's it. Now, if we were to render, of course, nothing would happen. Why? Because we haven't assigned the material to the actual geometry. So I'm going to click the geometry, right click on it, and I'm going to go assign existing material, Majora's Mask Arnold. There we go. Now you can press number six and you're going to be able to see the colors here on the on the viewport if you want. But the important part is this one. When we hit render now, 
It's going to first convert the texture so that we can use it inside of the render. That usually takes a little bit of time, about uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, depending again on your system. The first time is, of course, a little bit like slower. And if your textures are 4K like mine is, then, of course, you're going to see that it takes a lot longer. And look at this. Amazing, right? It looks really, really clean. It looks really nice. It looks like a, like a mass just floating there in the middle of the forest. And we're going to make it look even better. So... Uh, yeah, we have this one right here. It's ready to go. How can we make this thing look cooler? Well, we have more maps, right? Like we, we right now we're only using the color map. It looks like a really polished, nice uh, element. One of the, the the other like maps that are going to really, really help is going to be the uh, roughness map. OK, because the roughness map is going to tell us which parts are shinier and which parts are not as shiny. So I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to show you the second way to create a texture. I'm going to press shift and I'm going to write file. I'm going to go into this file texture and just hit enter. And this is going to create a file texture node. Now, in this file texture node, I'm going to go into the image name. And we're going to bring in the roughness. The roughness is a black and white map. It should be a black and white map that has the information of what parts of the character are, well, uh, like shinier and which ones are rough, right? Depending on the on the way we calibrated these things inside of Substance Painter. Now, the problem with this one, and it's really, really important that you guys understand this because it's a very common mistake. The problem with this one is that Maya automatically adds a color correction thing to this image. So even if we painted certain things black and certain things white or any like gradient in between inside of Substance, by applying this color correction thing, it's actually modifying those values and things might look different here instead of Maya than they look in Substance, and we don't want that. So how do we fix that? Very easy. Here on the file node, you're going to go to color space and you're going to do this for every single uh, black and white image that you're using. So if you're using a metallic one, for instance, later on, this would be the place to do so as well. And here in the color space, we're going to change the sRGB and we're going to change this to utility raw. So we want blacks to be blacks and the whites to be whites. We don't want any sort of like change on the volume or on the elements. Now, uh, other thing we want to do is we're going to go all the way down here and we're going to turn on this thing called alpha is luminance. That's important as well. And what we can do is we can go into this object and we need to go into specular roughness. Now, you guys remember the little like uh, game that we played when we were kids, like triangle goes into triangle, circle goes into circle. Well, if I try to bring the alpha channel into the specular roughness, it works. If I do that, try to do that out color into the specular color, it does, or the specular roughness, it doesn't work. Why not? Because the out color actually has three values into it, R, G, and B. And right now, we don't want that. We only want the alpha channel. So this goes into specular roughness. And that's why uh, we created or we clicked this button right here called the alpha is luminance. Because right now what it's doing, it's grabbing the, the color information and it's bringing that into the alpha. And that alpha is what we're inputting here into the specular roughness. And now, as you can see, certain areas of the element are going to be a little bit more shiny and certain areas of the element are not going to be as shiny. And that's it. Our second texture is uh, done. Now let's go to the third texture. And uh, if we go into our files right here to see uh, the textures that we're using, you're going to see that we're missing the height, the metalness, the normal. And that's it. Those three textures, right? Now, do we need the metalness? The question is, do we have metal areas in our object or all or, 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 oh, that? Nah. No. Well, the answer is no. I made a mess out there or in that phrase. Damn. It's really difficult to say all of those words together. So the question was, do we have any objects that are made out of metal? And the answer is no. Our object has no objects or no parts that are made out of metal. Therefore, this map right here is empty. It has no information because everything is considered a non-metal. Therefore, we don't need this uh, texture right now. We can actually delete it and we're going to be completely fine. Now, one of the textures that everyone knows how to use, or at least learns how to use very early in their 3D career, is this normal map texture, right? The normal map has normal information that gets transferred onto the surface of the object so that it seems that it has more detail than it actually does. So let's do that one. And there's two ways to do the normal map. I'm going to show you the one that I like the most. I like to use a node called the AI normal map node, okay? Why? Because the AI normal map node has a couple of things that we can use if the normal map looks wrong. Now, to the AI normal map, we need to plug in a file node. So we're going to go file texture, and we're going to plug in this file texture, this color, into the input. And of course, in this file texture, we're going to select our normal map. Look at that information. So much information there, but that's fine. Now, this normal map that we have right here, it's going to go into this AI normal map, and the out value is going to go into the normal camera uh, plugin here. 
Now immediately, since I haven't paused the render, it's actually calculating, it's transforming the, the texture and it's calculating the effects. And you're gonna see the effect appear up here in just one second. So let's just wait a couple of uh, seconds for this to properly do the, the transformation. And there you go. So now, as you can see, there is normal information, it's there. It's just very subtle. You can see like some of the changes right there. It's just very, very, very subtle. And uh, it, it kind of gives me the impression that it might be inverted. Sometimes it gets inverted. I'm not, no, it's actually looking good. You can see the normal map here, how it looks like a hole. Uh, and that's it. I mean, it looks okay, but this is not what we want, right? Like we had so much more information on the, on the element. And yes, this is working properly, but it's not working perfectly. So I'm going to go here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the color space. Let's pause this thing right, right quick. I'm going to change this color, color space. And this also should be set to raw because this is not supposed to be color correct or anything. It's supposed to be a normal map. Um, now, in order to compare the two things, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a snapshot right here, store a snapshot, and now I'm going to render. So now when we render, since this is now properly set to uh, raw, you can see that now we get the proper detail. Look at how nicer this things look. This is without the raw thing. And this is with the raw thing and see how it actually it is actually looking closer to what we have inside of substance like even the little holes up here they look a little bit closer to what we have so yeah that's uh that's pretty much it that's the that's the uh the plugging of or the or the creation of the um what's the word of the normal map now there's one more that we're missing one more map and that's the hide map and the hide map is supposed to be a black and white map okay it's supposed to be a black and white map we can actually see it here inside the substance. I'm gonna press C until we get into the, into the height map. That's the roughness, normal height map, there we go. So this map right here has information on where and how we need to push all of the different elements so that we get that nice variation on the wood that we have here with the displacement. Remember how these things are actually like pushing and pulling the geometry? That's the kind of thing that I wanna have on my element. However, to properly get this, I actually need to export this in 32 bits EXR. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna change my file type to EXR. This is gonna be 32 float EXR. And I'm gonna change the place because if I do this, uh, it's gonna replace the ones that we have. So I'm gonna call this 32 bit. I'm gonna say select folder. And I'm just gonna say export. Should be pretty much the same thing in, in regards to speed. Like you're not gonna see any, any change. But now we have these things in 32-bit EXR. And the one that we only need, the only one that we need, it is the height information. Why do we need this to be 32-bit uh, like floating elements? Because it's going to have more information and it's going to give us a softer, nicer displacement map, okay? So this one that we have right now, the, the height map from the target files, we don't need that one. Right now we're only using the normal map, the roughness, and the base color. This one's, we could use the 32-bit float as well, but it's fine if we use the other ones. Usually you're going to be using these other ones. Now, let's jump back into Maya and let's plug that one in. That one's a little bit different, okay? We're gonna be using a different uh, procedure. First of all, I'm gonna press a uh, shift and I'm gonna write a displacement shader. And this is gonna create two things. It's gonna create a displacement shader right here and it's gonna create a displacement shader group. What we need is this node right here. But as you can see, this thing is plugged into this called, thing called the displacement shader. And our material has its own displacement shader up here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna disconnect from here and we're gonna connect here. And this one, bye-bye, we don't need you anymore. And this is the displacement shader that we need. This is the node that's gonna actually displace the geometry in our elements. However, as you can see, it's expecting a displacement value. So we're gonna bring in a file texture again. Another file texture. And this file texture, of course, it's gonna be our 32-bit displacement map. This one right here, I'm just gonna hit open. And there we go. So the out color of this guy, it's gonna go into that displacement. Now, if you can't do that, don't worry. You can just grab the R channel and get that into the displacement. Most of the information that you're seeing on that channel right there, it's gonna be right there. Now, as you can see, the displacement is trying to work. It is moving things around, but it's giving us a really, really wonky result. I'm gonna show you how to fix this. In order to fix this, we need to understand how displacement works, right? So let me go into paint real quick. And if you think about displacement, usually you would have like a plane. And the more times you divide the plane, the more like geometry you can push and pull like up and down. If you have like a plane made out of like say four pixels and you wanna create a mountain, well, you're only gonna be able to create a mountain like this with four pixels and that's it. However, if you have a plane made out of a thousand pixels, then you could create like a really, really complex mountain because you have more points to push, right? Well, the same thing is happening right here. This object is made out of a lot of polygons and that of course is allowing us to push some of those polygons and create some like interesting effects right here. 
However, if we had more polygons, the detail that we could get would be even better. And that's what we want to do right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this object. I'm going to go into Arnold and I'm going to go down here to the subdivision options. I'm going to change this to CAD mode Clark. I'm going to change this to two or three iterations. This is going to subdivide or, or smooth these things more at render time. So right now we're rendering exactly this amount of polygons. By having iterations, it's like applying two more smooths, but once we render. Let me save this real quick because I don't think we have saved in all this time. Let's just call this Majora's Mask. And now uh, the only thing I need to do is I need to hit render. And what's going to happen is since we have more divisions on our object, right? It's going to be able to more properly like create the surface that we want. And now vertices and everything is going to really be pushed to where we need it. Now, if you feel like your displacement's a little bit too intense, for instance, like the eyes are getting a little bit like too, too much of like a weird effect, we can actually change that by going here into the displacement shader and the scale, we can reduce this, let's say like 0.5. If we do 0.5 uh, like um, replacement, it's pretty much like lowering the intensity of the displacement by 0.5. So it's not gonna be as intense. And that my friends looks really, really good. Now, if you've been watching all the way until this point, congratulations, because you're about to see a very, very nice trick that I'm gonna show you. If you remember, right now we have this color thing, right? This, this color object or this color information. And I would like the eyes to glow. I want the eyes to glow a little bit more. So I'm gonna go into substance and the, I'm gonna extract a mask so that we can very easily select only the eyes from everything else, okay? Here's how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna create a new fill layer here and uh, it's gonna be on the top here. And then on this fill layer, I'm gonna create a, a uh, white, no, a black mask and I'm gonna select the eyes with white like this. So this mask pretty much has only the eyes painted as white, right? I'm gonna select this and I'm gonna say S export a mask to file. We're gonna export this right here. I'm gonna call this eyes mask. And it's just gonna be a simple JPEG, a super simple JPEG, this one right here that has black and white. That's all we have. But why is that important? Well, because we actually have a glow section here on our material, our emission right here. And the emission has two channels, a color channel and a weight channel. And on the weight channel, which is kind of like a mask channel, we can select that one that we just exported out this eye mask element, and that's gonna tell this thing to only glow on that area. Now, what colors do we wanna use to glow there? Well, of course, the same colors that we already have. So we can just bring this out color right here. Oh, let's bring this up. This out color from our basic color and have it on the emission color. And now if we render, our eyes are gonna glow, are gonna emit light with the same colors that we have. You can see how the whole image gets more like way, way lighter because they are actually like pushing uh, like photons into the scene, right? So yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Now, if we want that we can balance out how we see it. Let me, let me show you just so that you guys can see that this is actually glowing. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna lower the exposure to like a minus two. And you can see how like all of this light is coming from the, from the eyes themselves. So yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. I'm gonna stop the video right here. And in the next one, we're gonna talk about a little bit more lighting situation or lighting scenario and how we can prepare this to make it way, way more cinematic. So hang on tight and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye-bye. Very well, guys, we're approaching now the final section of this special series. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed it so far. And uh, there's one thing I forgot to do in the last part, which was to make sure to uh, keep, get this to raw and alpha is luminance. And now, as you can see, whoop, the eyes are properly glowing the way I was expecting them to glow right now. Or before that, we were actually getting like a really general glow everywhere else. So let's bring this back to zero or, or actually I, mean, I, I kind of want to keep it low. Let's do like a minus. Minus two was actually quite nice because it was kind of like a night forest scene. Yeah, there we go. And you can see how this thing's like actually like emitting light very, very nicely from the from the eyes. So um, now that we have this, we can start talking about or thinking about our actual like composition, the kind of thing that we want to do to to make it or create a final render for our for our Majora's Mask. So one, there, there's three factors for a good cinematic a render or a good cinematic approach. Of course, you have to have a great model, you have to have great textures, and then after that, you have to have a great camera and you have to have a great lighting setup. So let's start with the camera because I think that's one of the easy ones. I'm gonna go to rendering. I'm gonna create a camera. I'm gonna say panels look through selected. 
And uh, if we click this button up here, which is called the, the resolution gate, this is what the camera actually sees. And this is what we're going to be seeing on our uh, render. Now, as we've mentioned before, we're not actually going to be using this background as our background. You can if you want to, but uh, it's really difficult to match it perfectly. So I'll rather have just transparency and then um, and then just do a little comp inside of Photoshop. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to go into the HDR itself. And down here in the visibility options, I'm going to bring this visibility down to zero. Okay. And at zero visibility, if I were to render now, so I hit render, this is what we get. So a very nice Majora's Mask just floating there in space, uh, the eyes glowing and the nothing on the bottom. If we click this button, you can see that there's transparency. So eventually, if we export this as an image, we're going to be able to uh, create a composition inside of uh, Photoshop. So I'm going to stop it right now. And we need to talk about something called focal length, which is a very useful uh, like term that you need to know about cameras. Every single camera has this thing called focal length, which is the distance between the lens and the focal point of your camera. This changes as your lens changes, the, the distance changes, and of course the result is also gonna change. The general rule that you need to understand is that you're gonna have uh, like a wide range of field and small range of field, kind of like this. So the lower your focal length, the wider your range of uh, like a visual like area is gonna be. Um, but the, the less uh, like focused you're going to be. So if you want to take a picture of something that's really far away and really focused, you're going to, you're probably going to use like this telephoto lens, like really, really low focal length. If you're going to take like a really expansive kind of like an environment scene, you're probably going to go for something like this. So if you want like an epic view here for our, our character, we can go with a low focal length. I'm going to go, I'm going to select the camera right here right here and on the options here, control A to make sure you're in the attribute editor. I'm going to write down 24. And this is going to allow me to go really close to the to the Majora's Mask. And the closer we get, the more distortion we're going to get. See that? So it's going to give me a really, really nice effect. Now, if we want to get close with no distortion, you're going to bring this up to something like a 55. And that way it's going to look a lot flat, flatter. See how it looks without that much of a distortion? We can actually go to like 18. That's going to give us even more uh, of an effect. And I think something like this looks cool. I kind of want to go from, I kind of want to see this mask from from below like this. So now if we go here and we render, this is what we got. And you can see that this distortion is going to give us a very, very nice sort of like cinematic effect. We can like turn this around a little bit more. It will, of course, depend on, on the composition that you want to go for. But I think this one looks really cool. Now, right now, in regards to the light scenario that we have right now, we're using this sort of like general light, right? Like we're using this forest and the forest is giving us light all around the, the mask, which is fine. Uh, but I want to give it a little bit more of a specific light setup. And uh, here's where using this reference is going to be really, really helpful because we need to think about what light sources are close to the character. Let's say there's a, um, what's the word, like a torch or like a fire camp or something close to the character. So I'm going to go to perspective view right here. And I'm going to go Arnold lights, and I'm going to create an area light. The area lights are the basic lights here inside of Arnold. And there's two main things that you need to know about them. The bigger the shape, the softer the shadows. So I'm going to keep the shape small, kind of like a like a like a fireplace. And I'm going to actually move this thing to where I would imagine the fireplace to be, which would be like right around here. I'm going to point it towards the camera because I definitely do want to have it pointing towards it. And now if I hit render, nothing really happens. Why? Because even though we're using realistic lights, we need to increase the exposure or the intensity so that the light actually reaches the object. So I'm actually going to leave this on. And if we start with like a 10 exposure, nothing yet, 15. There we go. We start to see something. And if we go to like 20, this is going to be way, way too much, right? So I think something like an 18 is going to be fine. Maybe 17 is going to work. There we go. That works really, really nice. It's giving us those, those amazing shines here on the character. We can see the actual holes on the Madras mask. We can see the, the hide information. Like this is looking quite, quite nice. The only thing I don't love about this one is that it's very white. It looks like a, just like white light. And that's not the way a, a light should work. So another concept, and aren't you glad you guys are watching this tutorial? If you like it, make sure to support us throughout all of the different uh, things that we offer, because uh, this is what keeps us going. So there's this thing called light temperature, and light temperature allows you to change how the light is going to look. The lower the number, the warmer it's going to be, the higher the number, the, the bluer or cooler it's going to be. Uh, so yeah, in this case, if we want like a warm fireplace or like a fire thing, uh, we're going to bring this use color temperature and bring this down. So it looks like this thing is being, um, what's the word? So it, it kind of looks like this thing is being uh, hit with this sort of like a fireplace effect. Now we can move this thing to the side, for instance, 
so the shadows are not hitting it as much. And remember, if we make the shapes like smaller, the shadows are going to be harsher. If we make the shape bigger, the shadows are going to be softer. So it also depends on how how big or how small you want the fireplace to give, to be. In this case, I think something like this looks really, really, really cool. Look at that. Really nice, right? Oh, that's looking, <laughs> it's looking amazing, amazing, amazing. Now, there's another light that we have here on the reference, and this is sort of like the moonlight or like a like a cool light coming from the from the side, kind of like a ring light giving us some some of the details. And I do think that's going to be important. So I'm gonna bring or I'm gonna bring my camera all the way to this side. I'm gonna go into Arnold lights, add another area light, bring this thing, whoop, bring this thing up here. It's going to be more like a moonbeam. So something like this. And this light is going to be using color temperature as well. It's going to be a lot cooler. And again, we need to start playing with the intensity. 10, not doing much. 15, we start seeing something there. 20, a lot better. Look at that. Really, really intense, really, really sharp color. 20 might be a little bit too much. Let's bring this back to like 18. And we can play around with the temperature here as well. Maybe like cooler or not as cool. It depends. On this one, I can kind of see this like a very, very nice soft light coming from the side. So I'm going to bring this thing lower and a little bit more to the front. So we can see the side. And I'm going to make the shape a lot bigger so that it's softer. So the shadows are softer. And then I'm going to start bringing the exposure down. I do want to see the light, but not as much. This is going to keep it really like we're actually going to be seeing like there's nothing being hidden from from us, which is uh, an interesting artistic decision that we can uh, that we can take here. But it might. Uh, it, it, well, it's just an artistic decision. I'm going to go to the camera. I want to try another like composition. So I'm going to say panels, look through selected. There we go. A little bit more like center. Something like that. That looks quite, quite nice. Now, I'm going to show you here. This is a little bit more of an advanced trick, but I think you guys are going to appreciate it. Um, you can imagine that since if we're in a forest, we would expect to see some sort of like things, right? Like crashing against the object. So we can actually use like shapes, like cylinders. And if this is like a moonbeam, we can just like add like weird shapes on front of the light. And that's going to break up the light shape a little bit. Now, this is going to break it a little bit more if the light shape is a little bit smaller. Like this. And one thing we can do is we can reduce the spread right here. And the spread's kind of like a focus. So see how we're getting those like interesting shapes right there. Of course, we need to bring the exposure down as well. That's just a quick, nice little way to to add a little bit of complexity to this thing because we're never going to see those guys, right? Like that's not something that we're seeing. But just the fact that they're going to be in front of the light. There we go. That's the kind of stuff. Look at that. Just the fact that they're going to be in front of the light, as you can see there, they're going to change the shape of the light. And, uh, and that could also help to create like an interesting uh, composition, especially because I know that we're going to be adding a forest on the back of the of the thing. And by adding a forest, um, we can like it, it's going to make a little bit more sense that we have that sort of effect. Let's lower the intensity there a little bit, just because you can see that this thing is getting burnt a little bit there. Maybe not that many of these guys. Let's delete like one or two. So we see a little bit more. There we go. Maybe a little bit more spread. It's going to soften up the shadows a little bit more there. And there we go. Look at that. You guys like it? I like it. I think it looks nice. Panels. Look through like the. There we go. So that's our shot. Now I'm gonna have one last thing. This is a little bit of a, again an advanced trick, but if you've been um, uh, if you've been working with uh, this project for or all the way to this point, I think you guys are gonna really enjoy adding this sort of detail at the end, which is a little bit of. Um, What's the worth? A little bit of uh, depth of field. But before that, I do think the light's a little bit of overexposed. 
both of them are a little bit more exposed. There we go. Just to keep a little bit more like mystery, mystery darker colors. There we go. So I'm going to select the camera right here. And uh, we're going to go all the way down to Arnold. And we're going to select um, enable depth of field. Depth of field will allow us to well, defocus certain things. I'm going to click this object. And I know that this object is 42 units away from my camera. So my focal distance is going to be, uh, or focus distance is going to be 42 units away. And then as I start increasing the aperture size, as you can see here, we're going to start getting more and more uh, depth of field. You can see it over here. Like if we go to like 10, everything gets like distorted, like it's out of focus, right? 10 is of course too much. I'm going to say one. And what's going to happen is uh, this part right here, is going to be a little bit more blurred than this part right here. If you want to increase that a little bit more and make it a little bit more intense, we can go for like a three. And it's going to give us the very nice effect. That's a little bit too much, I would say. But if you want to go for it, um, you're completely free, right? Like you can you can create the renders however you want to make sure that you get the best possible result. Let's stop this one right here. The render, I mean. I'm going to go into my uh, options because one of the things I definitely want to do is I want to change this to uh, full HD. So we're going to go HD 1080. There we go. And now if we render, we got way, way more pixels. It's, of course, going to take a little bit longer. Uh, it should be a little bit cleaner as well. And that's it. Now I can definitely see that my uh, intensity on the on the depth of field is a little bit too much. So I'm going to bring this down to one. So we can see things more in, in focus. Look at that detail. Really, really cool, right? Not freaking bad. Um, so I'm going to stop it. And one last thing I'm going to do before I pause this video and we go into the final section, which is uh, just a quick Photoshop. I'm going to go here to Arnold Render, Adaptive Sampling, and I'm going to enable this. This is going to uh, like give way, way, way more samples to the render. And uh, it, it should give us like an even cleaner result, although it's going to take quite a bit longer. So I'm not sure how much this is going to take. I'm guessing like probably like five minutes or so. Um, but I'm going to be sure to have like the least amount of noise plus the denoiser. So you can see uh, slowly but surely moving down here. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to pause this real quick, guys. Let me wait for this render to finish so that you don't have to wait with me. And um, I'll see you after this quick uh, jump so that we can go into Photoshop and create an amazing uh, post-production. Very well. So yeah, <laughs> this is the final result. I'm really happy how, how this turned out. I, I think it's an amazing render. I was looking at my old render, one of the old renders that I did. Let me let me see if I can show it to you. Uh, That's really weird. Oh, uh, save as. No, it can't. It doesn't load me. But yeah, it was a render. It, it didn't look as good as this one, so don't worry. Now uh, let's very quickly take this into into Photoshop to give it a couple of last touches and, and generate like the final image. So we're gonna say File, Save Image. We're gonna save this on our Images folder, of course, and we're just gonna call this Majoras. Very important, save it as a dot, either PNG or Targa. So I'm going to save this as a Targa. Okay. Now we jump into Photoshop. That's my little cover uh, thing that I use for this. We're going to go into images and we're going to open it. And on the channels, we should have the alpha channel. So if we need to cut this transparency out. Well, there it is, right? So how are we going to make this? Very easy. We're going to go into the internet and we're going to look for um, uh, forest at night to get like just some silhouettes of a forest. A anything works really. Like we're not going for anything specific. Like this one right here looks really cool. Let's say copy image. Thank you very much to... Um, who's this guy? This is a concept art. Uh, Tobias Hoffman. Thank you very much, my friend for uh, <laughs> on, on the unknowingly helping us create an amazing element. Let's go here. I'm going to grab this one, control click, and then just uh, create a mask. So we can cut this thing out of the of the element right there. Grab this image and we're going to say filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and we're going to blur the hell out of this. We just want the general colors. That's all we want. Let's make this thing a little bit smaller. There we go. And now to give this thing a little bit more of a, you know, whole thing here, I'm going to call, I'm going to look for a uh, fire texture. And as you can see, we have this sort of things. So we can grab something like this. It's perfect. 
copy image, paste, bring this on the front or to the front of the character, control T, change this, have this over here, doesn't have to be like super close. And we're gonna as well filter the hell out of this. So filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Not that much, just a little bit like this. There we go. And then we're gonna use this blending mode called uh, screen or lighten, lighten or screen, both of them work. I think the screen works a little bit better. I'm just gonna hit control L to change a couple of the values here, especially the black ones. We're gonna push them a little bit higher so we don't see it. There we go. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is, we can use this just like small poof of fire right there to make it seem like uh, things are closer. Um, you can also look for uh, like uh, fire uh, sparks. And you're gonna find this kind of things, kind of like far, from a fireplace or something. Even this one looks really nice. This one looks even better. Copy image. And this is all post-production, right? All post-production. Same thing. We're going to change this to something like a screen. And then we can, press con we can pl play with levels to push the dark colors up. And we can add a little bit of blur. So filter, blur, Gaussian blur. In this case, I'm not going to add as much. Like that. There we go. Uh, we can look for like a moonbeam or, or they're also called sometimes like God rays. God ray texture. It's this guy's right here. So I'm going to look for some soft ones. I don't want to go super intense right now. Give me just one second. Yeah, something like. I mean, this one looks cool. Let's see if we can make this work. I know this is like a like a little bit of a lens flare. I'm gonna right click and flip horizontal. Get this in here. Control U to change the colors. We're gonna change the colors to like blue colors. Same deal. We're gonna uh, screen. Control L to change the values. Push the blacks. And we can erase some of these things right here. We can leave some of the, or actually let's keep them and just like blur them. So blur, gosh, and blur. This one I am gonna heavily blur now. And we're just gonna move this thing like this. Uh, definitely bring the opacity down. It's just a little bit of a, of a bloom there that we wanna add. And uh, yeah, I mean, that that's pretty much it. I'm thinking about like, because I remember like some some like fireflies. So I can try like, let's see if there's some like firefly texture or something. Yeah, yeah, we have some magic fireflies. So for instance, we can add this guys right here. Like go into our soft brush. Delete the ones that are closer to him or to the fire. And again, just filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Blur them just a little bit so they seem to be like on a, on a different plane. Uh, we can change the opacity a little bit as well. And at this point, you can go as crazy as you want with your compositions. Uh, I think cropping wise, mine's a little bit too cropped to the left. So I'm going to just push it a little bit there. And one last thing I'd like to add, this is, this is just a one of my things that I always feel like makes it look a little bit more cinematic, just a couple of letter boxes, like there and there, makes it look more like a, like an actual uh, movie movie screenshot, right? And uh, yeah, there we go, guys. If you've made it all the way to this point, then congratulations. You've just learned the basic things about uh, Substance Painter and things that you can do with it, how to actually like bring it into Maya and apply all of the things that you're gonna be needing. Uh, one more thing here, I think I'm gonna add a, I'm gonna add a color balance to the to the image back here. I'm just gonna go into the shadows and just bring the shadows like a little bit cooler. And the highlights a little bit warmer. And I'm thinking about adding a like exposure. But I just want the exposure to affect this one right here. 
And I want to lower the exposure a little bit. I don't know. No, I think it was it was fine. So no, no, no exposure correction. That's it. So yeah, it's a little bit contrasty. It's a little bit dark, but I think it goes with the concept. Uh, hopefully you guys liked it so far. Uh, make sure to check the the full course and make sure to check all of the other information that we have as well. Uh, we're always grateful for all of the support that you give the team. And uh, yeah, I'll see you back on the next uh, premium course. Bye bye.